Look at this. So disrespectful, man. Absolute f blitz. Does it get any better than a four-wheel drive turbocharged Nissan? A few years ago, we came across this N14 Nissan Pulsar GTIR, one of the weirdest and most wonderful two-door sport hatches to ever come out of Japan. Using the famous SR20 2.0-litre turbo engine that you'd normally find mounted 90 degrees the other way in a 180SX or a Silvia, Nissan added a transfer case and rear diff to make this thing four-wheel drive. This one needed a little bit of love after it had been sitting in someone's garage for years untouched. We got it running, installed a bunch of mods and a Haltech ECU to run the show and it spun up some good power on the dyno and has been choo-chooing its way around Sydney happily ever since. And while these cars didn't set the world on fire with their rally abilities, they have been popular with car enthusiasts all around the world ever since. And of course with some mild mods, they can make some good power. These cars were first released over 30 years ago, and clean examples like this one are becoming increasingly rare and increasingly valuable. I know it's hard to believe that early 90s cars are worth so much money now, but regardless of what kind of cars you're into or what you think they're worth, these cars are still, you know, someone's pride of joy. People have put a lot of time and effort into it. We put a lot of time and effort into this car. We obviously love GTIRs. We've had a number of them on the show. Season one of Mighty Car Mods 14 years ago, we were working on mine, and some absolute <laughs> knuckle. Um, has tried to steal this one, yeah. um, whether it's for the engine, whether it's for parts or whatever, but they've destroyed parts of the car in the process. And so we thought we'd do a couple of things today. A, kind of Marty's going to go through the anatomy of like how you steal a car like this, not so you can steal it, but so we can understand what we can do to try and prevent it happening. But also talk about some of the things that you can do to try and keep your car safe uh, in different ways. But first of all, just looking at um, how they got into the car. The reason it's so dusty, by the way, is the police have dusted it for prints. So there's, there are fingerprints all over it. Um, and it looks like we might have some footage also, um, well, which is going to the police. But regardless of that, um, the car has been damaged and someone's attempted to steal it. So let's jump in and have a look. This is what we think happened. Um, first thing we noticed is the surround on the door handle has been busted and it looks like that's been screwdrivered um, to try and get into the car. What I think happened is that didn't actually work. And so when they realized that they couldn't get it open this way, someone has grabbed here and just yanked it back. And you can see that it's like the door is shut or nearly shut. Oh, and you reckon they did that by hand? Yeah, and when you look here, you can see the crease. See that massive crease? So that whole window frame, that whole frame has been bent back. Now that's a technique that you will see more on cars without these frames. You yeah. know, people just grab the window and, and yank it. Now newer cars sort of go up into a slot so it, it can't be stolen. But back in the day, a lot of those pillars ones only just came in and you could just pull them out. But you're not going to be able to pull that back and then get your own hand in, right? Like that's going to be a, can you try pulling it back to see if I can get my hand? In? Yeah, like yeah, maybe. So even that, like I can't get my hand in maybe. there. So they must have fully yanked it. Um, th there would have been more than one people is what that suggests yeah, to me. Yeah, I'm guessing, that, guessing that's the case. And then to unlock it, you would have had to get either like a stick or something down there to flick the lock. Now, the lock on the GTIRs is sort of on the, uh, the door trim on the side. It's like the old one with the push buttons, which I think a lot of manufacturers moved away from them because it was yeah. too easy to get a tool and that just is, pop Because that it. is harder to grab. Yeah, they are hard to grab. And, you know, in my, my own case, when I've locked keys in cars and stuff, like that's usually the go. It's also quite heavy because it's got the central locking mechanism on it. But in some ways, you'd be like better off for them to smash the window than like do that much damage well, where do you get a gtr door you from? don't you don't i've already started asking questions about you know now that we're looking at repairing and insurance and this sort of stuff like i've already started asking questions and yep. you just don't get doors there was more stuff coming for this car because obviously the evolution of this car is continuing um on the show and so there's more stuff coming for mm. it that we'll kind of get into later um quick side note of this um the car's insured with shannon so that's that's, I mean, that's something for later in the video, but the most important part is that actually is going to be it'll, covered. It'll be but repaired, yeah. It's going to be covered if and when you can get the stuff. And that's yeah. the thing with these cars. There's currently none for sale, which is probably why it is so valuable. That's right. Um, but anyway, have a look inside. Well, what... no, well, we answered our own questions. There's no, oh. no cars for sale and it's hard to get parts. So, I mean, people get desperate. Or oh, people are just assholes. But I anyway. guess they're not thinking about trying to protect the car when they steal. Because I'm like, if you're gonna just break a window that we might be able to replace rather than break this. Yeah. But anyway, this is this is what's happening so on the inside. Step two: Someone's obviously tried to drive it away. Now, sometimes people, if they want a car bad enough, they stick it on a till train. It goes. So that's where trackers and other things come into their own, which we'll speak about later. But what you can see here is step number two: is someone has just smashed all the bottom of the cluster off, and then they've smashed the lock barrel off, and then to attempt to get to the switch in the back. Now, way back when you do not see this anymore, by the way, but way back when I mean there's just a switch in the back and then this key barrel is replaceable and it's different for each car so that was enough security and I guess they just figured that that was so much effort that you know to steal the car that would be that now this car is from the early 90s so a lot has changed in that time um, these days and I think it's worth mentioning when we did Yaris Hilton the biggest 
time-consuming thing that we had to do to get that we car working. We couldn't start our own car. Do you remember? Car. We couldn't, yeah, start we couldn't even car. start our own car. It took, of the transponder. it took like 24 hours from the time like, when we tried to get it started till we actually got it started because it needed the transponder. Now, we could hack it with a different, you know, particular transponder chip and all this sort of stuff, but really... To fix it, we had to replace the box for the transponder. So there's three parts. There's the ECU, the transponder box, and the key, and they all talk to each other. If you don't have the right key for the right tran transponder box, it will not trigger the ECU to say that it will start. Um, even Honda Civics, I think, had this kind of system as well. Um, and so the transponder box, part of the security system, is buried up under the dash, like buried to the point we had to hack the dash up to get to it. Back in the day, they didn't do that. So I think because of theft, especially with cars like this, they're pretty desirable. Manufacturers started putting some money into it to make it happen. So it's been, it's been smashed off and then it's attempted to be started. Now, luckily, this car has an immobilizer buried up in there somewhere. And I use the word buried intentionally because the more you can bury that, the better. Someone who's really smart will probably be able to work out how to bypass it, especially if it's just right here and really easy to do. If, it's, if it could be anywhere in the car, you could have it in the back near the fuel pump, you could have it near the ignition system in the bay, you can have a combination, you can have multiple switches. Even the most basic kill switch potentially can thwart someone because you just turn the fuel pump off, whatever it is. I'm pretty sure this immobilizes a fuel pump one, um, but it varies, you can disable all sorts of circuits. And so when that hasn't worked, the immobilizer's got in the way. I mean, also the battery didn't have much charge in it, so that might have been good too because as you're cranking, trying to get it to start and the immobilizer preventing it, it's wearing that battery down, wearing that battery down to the point where it wouldn't crank anymore. And then um, based on that though, and one of the things that we can't quite work out is that the battery's gone. Yeah. And so that one, that's a kind of a bit of a strange one because there would be no reason to take that battery Ten unless... 10 bucks in scrap value? I mean, like, I mean, do you try and steal a $50,000 car and then you run off with a battery? It's possibly likely that instead they were off to try and maybe get a battery as a replacement to come back another time, hoping that no one would notice. Um, the car's obviously been moved from that location. Obviously, yeah. it's it's here now. But why take the battery? That one, there's a that's yeah. that's a random one. But I it may have been the dead battery that also was part of what saved the car. I don't understand that either. So, so with that in mind, there's a few things you can think about um, in terms of securing something like this. Uh, number one is you can incorporate like a more modern immobilization system. Um, if you want to save some money, get a wrecked car, go to a wreckers and just grab you know, a key and the, the transponder signal and the immobiliser. If you've got some wiring smart, you can make that happen. Aftermarket, you can do it as well. Um, and also trackers is a big one. Now, these days, as simple as an air tag, yes, they make noises when, you, when you're nearby, but still, it's, it's the deterrent. Or something and it's the similar, yeah. You might, you know, if the thing moves and you've set yep. it to, to alert you when it moves, then that's simple. There's some really, really good these days aftermarket, like 3G and 4G trackers that are so smart that if a voltage drops occurs from when a central locking goes off or the car moves like a metre, yeah. It will notify you. It will ring your phone. It will um, message you and tell you. So um, I'm running a system like that in the 240Z, basically. So uh, something like that, when it starts, where it stopped, where it's gone, mm. um, what state different kind of, you know, what state different parts of the car are at. There's also kind of, you know, 14 years ago, it's funny talking about this because we did a really lo-fi video on installing a low, uh, a lo-fi video on kill installing switch. a kill switch, which, um, which we'll link so that you can check out. But if certain parts of your car don't work, you just can't turn them on so on one side you've kind of got that on the other side if you've got something like a halter you can actually you can actually set up mm. combo codes like in a street fighter which might be um if you press this button three times then this button then the, you can actually code your car so it requires something to start yep. and on the other end of that spectrum you've got things like what's on my 180sx which is a uh, hidden switch which is hidden in a place that would be very difficult for people to find yeah. um, and because um, we can need to touch that because we on. can hardly find it half the time yeah the Haltech's a good example you can program stuff in even so yeah the car'll start and run but guess what it's not revving over 800 rpm or mm. 1100 rpm yeah. so good luck actually driving it but you can you... Ju sorry just yeah, because no. this is a pretty crazy one what the kind of customization we're talking about kind of programming things like aircon switches mm. like you can fans, all sorts of stuff. So yep. you could set it up in a combination of ways that nobody would ever be able to guess. Like a valet mode, um, which is another way of doing it. You know, if you've got your certain combination of switches in the Haltech, sees that state and goes, okay, cool. Now you need inputs and outputs to do it, but either way, it's all achievable with modern tech. Like I said, trackers, um, aftermarket trackers specifically for cars, which run on 12 volt, which often have their own batteries. Now it's not gonna work if you leave your car for a month and not, not moving, but every time you get in the car and drive it, it charges the internal battery of the tracker um, and you can look at trickle charges and all sorts of things. So um, I had a quick Google of um, GTIR theft mm -hmm. and there are pages and pages and pages of forum threads and posts and people looking for their stolen GTIR. So it's obviously a thing. People want SR20s. They mm. go in a lot of different cars. There are cool 
engine. You know, they don't sound great, I know, but they're <laughs> a cool engine. Um, this is obviously a really powerful version of it. The, the price of cars has just gone through the roof, as we've been talking about recently, so mm. the car is worth a lot. But what do you do with a stolen GTIR? I mean, it's kind of it's a very small and niche community of cars yeah. in Australia. There's hardly any of them. Yeah. I think um, with you with you stealing a car or breaking into someone else, it's just a it's just a scum it's act scummy, is man. what it is. It's, so it's just it's not your shit. You didn't work for it. Nah. Um, and you're just wrecking someone else's pride of joy. And guess what? People love their cars. This is not just a, oh, I just want to drive my car. People love their cars. Yeah. They're very meaningful for them. And you've yeah. got no right to touch them. So go f*** yourself. <laughs> yeah, pretty much what he said. Anyway, so have a think about things you can do. Now, the more modern your car is, the harder it is to steal. That's just the truth. Not many things are going to get past a tilt tray. But again, modern cars, stuff is coded. Keys are coded. Um, if you've got one of those remote keys, be careful it's not too close to the car. There are stories yeah. of cars still being able to be opened. Even if it doesn't get stolen, your stuff might get stolen out of it because your keys actually just close enough to the car that it might activate the locks. Yep. Um, same thing, those, you also don't want to get in trouble where someone's going to come and you know try and beat you up just to take your key from while you're sleeping in bed. So yep. keep all those which things is the thing in mind. That's happening. Yeah. Which is happening as well. Yep. But, um, but again, those modern cars, they're, they're much easier to track. Um, you know, There's a lot more in the system. These things are old and been through various states of registration and, and, and again, not that hard initially to steal. So luckily, technology's moved on. This method doesn't work so well. Luckily, this had some technology that is the reason it's still here and not in someone's shed being pulled apart and being sold on Facebook Marketplace for parts, which is realistically what was happening, what was going to happen to make some make some money. It's risky, but it's done. Um, and so, yeah, have a think about some of that tech that you can incorporate that might potentially help your car from getting stolen. And as boring as it sounds, just another reminder: we've been talking about this a bit recently because we're in this we're in this like newfound land when it comes to cars' values. Make sure your car's value is appropriately mm. insured. And yep. so, if you've had an S13 for the last 20 years that you bought for six thousand dollars, it's not worth six thousand dollars anymore. It could be worth sixty thousand dollars. It's worth actually investigating that and finding out and making sure that your value is what your car is insured for. Because back in the day, I remember having lots of conversations with people who had Sylvias, and they're like, "We're not going to pay two or three grand insurance." because our car's only worth $5,000. Those days Fine. are done. Those days yeah. are done. S13s, S14s, S15s, yep. GTRs, MR2s, Golfs. I mean, the price of them has gone through the roof and you want to make sure that you can cover it. So luckily, yep. um, this one here is covered. Um, on that, but, you know, it's... And, and on that point changes. of... Part of the reason you do that as well, not just because, yes, the car's a complete loss, maybe you get a big payout. It's not necessarily about that. They also use the value of the car to justify repairs, right? So if you've got this car insured for 15 grand and a door repair out of Japan for a new one's going to be like $3,500, they're starting to think, hey, this might not be worth it, plus paint, plus labor, plus locks, plus new barrels, plus all this. And they might go, dudes, that's like $12,000 worth of repairs on a 15 grand car. Yep. Now your car's insured for $50,000, which in a recent episode we went and got our RX-7 value and they explained that just because the values might be double doesn't mean the premium is. They're sort of insuring the person. Um, that If you have that value, a $12,000 repair on a $50,000 car, okay, let's the talk about it. The makes it and, more I mean, insurance well, yeah. companies, yep. I mean, the, you know, it's a calculator, it's, it's an algorithm, it's, it's their, their own sort of internal stuff. You just got to make sure you're on the right side of it, talk to them, make sure it's sorted out, and then problems like this can go away. Because at the end of the day, you want the problem to go away, do the best you can to secure your car, and then just get on with driving it and enjoying it. Have a look at kill switches. Technology. Obviously, make sure, um, you know, if there's, if there's ways of updating your keys for transponders and things like that, immobilizers, kill switches hidden in the cars. Trackers. If your ECU is capable of actually doing some kind of coding, trackers on there, just do what you can. Hardware because bollards. If you've got a garage, stick a bollard. Hard there. It's like. gonna it's gonna keep happening. It's gonna keep happening. Um, anyway, thank you for watching. We will keep you posted. This is gonna um, get fixed and uh, it's gonna get fixed. Yeah. Next and then time the you mods see it, will continue. Next so. time you see it, we'll be doing some mad mods. We've got some stuff in the in the pipelines already on its way. I uh, don't know when it's gonna be, but it's pretty exciting. Keen to see this thing make some mad power. Yeah. All right, thanks everybody. See you next time. And please stop flogging people's cars. <laughs> you Just flog yourselves, you flogs. Just go and flog.